DDC, um, and they've probably seen me talk about it before as well. But um, I'm going to tell you about what I've been doing recently. Um, for those who are new, um, DDC is Ben's, Ben here at the front, Ben's compiler for a language called Disciple, which is a Haskell-like language. The DDC compiler is written in Haskell. Um, so I've got a compiler for a Haskell-like language written in Haskell, um, and I hack on that a bit. And the thing I'm going to talk about is just the, the LLVM backend, which I've done, and the foreign function interface, and constructors with unboxed fields. Um, and a bit of a disclaimer. Um, it might sound like I'm ragging on this compiler. Uh, that's really not the case. Okay. The, the, the compiler Ben did as part of a PhD thesis, and, and you know, while he was doing it, he was trying to get the PhD thesis done, not write an industrial strength commercial compiler. Um, so when I say there are bugs in the compiler, that's not surprising for something that's a byproduct of a PhD thesis rather than something you start out writing and say, I'm going to write a really great compiler. Um, not ragging on this at all, I really like working on this compiler, which is why I'm still doing it. The LLVM backend is actually now feature complete. <coughs> it's in the DDC head branch. Um, it compiles the full, um, the DDC compiler will run the full test suite with the LLVM backend. It will compile the DDC library written in Disciple via the LLVM backend and still pass all the tests. The actual compile speed producing an, an executable from a piece of code. It's a little bit slower than the existing C backend, but it actually produces faster executables. So there's a bit of swings and roundabouts there. Okay, so yes, I will repeat questions. The magnitude of the speed up and slow down, um, it's about 10 to 15 percent slower um, in compile speed and about 10 to 25 percent faster in executable speed. Um, doing this LLVM backend has actually been quite interesting in that it's uncovered some bugs and inconsistencies in the compiler. Specifically where um, back when Ben was working on it as part of PhD thesis, I think it pretty much assumed that everything was a boxed object. And I'll get to what those are in just a moment. But it assumed everything was a boxed object and later on other things were added like unboxed um, values and there are places in the compiler where it assumes that something is an object where it's actually not and the LLV backend, the LLVM backend, LLVM being a, um, a strongly typed assembly language really spits the dummy when you throw it rubbish. The C backend of course will just say well the C programmer said this was good stuff I'm just going to accept it. It'll actually say that a lot of the time where the LLVM backend would actually say no. Nah not going to happen. Um, I still need to do a cleanup of the LLVM backend, but I want to get some of this stuff that I'm working on just now done, and then that I'll be in a better position to do that. Um, just a quick aside, boxed versus unboxed. I'm assuming a large number of you will be aware of this already, but just in case there isn't anybody, boxed is the sort of thing you have in for most um, objects in Java or um, variables in Python. Everything at time you do, I'll do the Haskell thing. So if you've got a is an int 32 and then you say a is equal to 5. In the actual runtime, the thing that you are referring to as a is not actually an integer. It's actually a pointer to a bit of memory that has some metadata and then the 5. For unboxed values, it would actually be no pointer, but you would actually have this thing that's called A that is actually the integer 5. And the reason this is interesting, for instance, if you've got one pen, right pen here, do I just, if you do C equals A plus B, if these are all boxed values, it has to get A, do the pointer in direction, grab the value out of A, do the same with B, add them together, get the pointer for C, and then stuff it into the pointer. 
where, where the pointer points to. If it's unboxed values, it can just do, well, it's got the, phi, the A, it's got the B, add them together, stick it in C. It's far fewer instructions to actually do the thing. Um, those who have seen things about Disciple and DDC before will realize that um, DDC has um, mutable data, unlike Haskell, and it's only the unboxed values that are immutable. Um, sorry? Boxed. Boxed data that is mutable. <laughs> Ooh. And we spoke about this on IRC today. It, it's only the boxed values that are immutable. Um, Paul? Is that discernible via the type? Yes, it would be because each in the types, in the, 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 the types that are inferred that you don't actually see, this would actually have, if it's unboxed, it'll actually have a region say where that is, whereas for an unboxed value, there will be no region variable and you won't see it. Um, whoa. How bad is that? Comment up here. I'm looking at SRAND and RAND from the C standard library. Um, SRAND takes an unsigned int for seed and it's got a void return. RAND, a void parameter list and returns int. When I got my grubby hands on it, um, red, gee, what did I choose red for? That's word 32 hash. Um, like Haskell, if you have a type like word 32, yeah, the other one, that's the, here we go, that's much better, isn't it? Wonderful. Um, sorry? Yeah, no, it's fine. Fine, fine for everybody, that's, that's the question. Um, so, we, we're taking the, the, the unsigned scene, it's going to take a word 32 hash and return something. The problem actually is that this something, open close parenthesis in DDC, like in Haskell, is actually the unit type um, in base unit. And it's actually not the same thing as C's void. And um, particularly for the, when the parameter list there was void and we're returning an int 32. It wasn't actually the same thing. The C compiler in the, in, in the back end and the C back end would ac actually accept what the C back end was doing. And the LLVM back end said, there's something really wrong with that. I'm not accepting it. So something had to change, and that's what we got here. In the library, we added a void hash type. And that's sort of an unboxed void not something we're actually going to play with. And then we have we either return this unboxed void or we pass this unboxed void and get back the in32. That's the changes in the actual library and the actual code. In the compiler, add void this void hash type to the library. And then the compiler had to special case this as it, the internal compiler type of T void U, unboxed void, plumb that thing through the compiler, add special handling for functions. The basic pipeline for DDC is take the source code language, desugar it into a core language, which is where Ben does all the, the type checking and type inference stuff, then convert it into a, an imperative style language call that we call CCEA. And that gets converted into either the C that people actually still program in or LLVM for the back end. So what I had to do is take special handling for whenever I found a function which had a type with a single unboxed void in the parameter list, special case that to then in the, in the core to C translation stage. And of course, there was a whole bunch of knock-on effects in that there were still a bunch of these, a bunch of places where somewhere at the back end there was this object when it really shouldn't be an object, it should be this unboxed void or whatever. And tracing those back to their originating place in the compiler and fixing them back there was um, an interesting exercise. Um, 
that, it was actually once I fixed that, that was the last thing that I actually needed to get the LLVM backend working in the DDC head and passing all tests. Then I took on the task of constructors with unboxed fields. In Haskell, we can do things like, you know, data foo, foo is the type. There's another foo who, foo here, which is the constructor. And it says that a type foo, you generate that with a foo constructor and you give it an int and a float and it will then bundle that up as an object and you can use that through the program. In many cases, it would also be nice to be able to have, so when I got the, working on the compiler, Ben's thesis, it, these are both boxed values and everywhere it assumed that if it was a constructor, it was working on boxed values. However, for optimization reasons we, we mentioned earlier, um, it would be nice to also be able to have unboxed fields and that was a task I took upon myself and it's actually pretty close to working now, but we can do, th the particular thing that makes this interesting is we can do things like, we can say our boxed int32 has a constructor called int32 and then a named field unboxed. And then disciple also has these field projections. And to unbox a boxed int32, we can simply do x dot unboxed and pull the, the unboxed value out of that. Particularly good for writing library code where we might want to, where we might care more about um, performance and things than, than regular user code. That's the rationale. Um, this is a, so the question is what does the N32 do? And if I don't flip that one, but if I, this is the type. This is the constructor name, and the constructor takes one field which we've named. So it's simply a named field in the constructor, rather than having where the previous example here has two unnamed fields. And then because Disciple has, um, that's, that's in Haskell as well. So it, it, it's just like Haskell there. Uh, yes, this in 32 type would be a boxed okay, value. Be but, but we can then access the unboxed field within it using this field projection thing. And I hope the question didn't get lost there. But, um, so this, again, it was a whole thing where you start right at the, the front end of the compiler and fix things through and try not to break too much stuff. Modify the code to handle types, um, a type for each field in the constructor. Find and fix all the code that assumed the constructors held only boxed objects. Um, because of the way the, the objects were laid out in the runtime, it there was a problem with if you have a number of fields and they're sort of arbitrarily mixed between boxed and unboxed. In the runtime system, we have them so that it, it sort of assumes that all the boxed values are at the start and they're all ordered so that all the, the boxed ones comes first and then the unboxed. So find a solution to that, see in LLVM backends and fix the garbage collector bug which this showed up. Um, it's actually working, but I broke a whole bunch of stuff along the way and now I have to fix that. Um, I've got... I think it's 12 or 14 patches in my tree where I'm doing this that um, I need a few more little bug fixes and then that will be working and we'll have constructors with unboxed fields. For more on DDC, Ben's PhD thesis, particularly the first chapter, is really good to explain the rationale behind it. We've got a Disciple Cafe Google group mailing list. We've got the main Disciple page and the bug tracker and hash disciplined on Freenode. Any questions? We've had questions. One more from Paul. Yes. Do you have any customers? Do we have any customers? <laughs> um, we have people that drive by and, and give it a whirl and sort of then keep an eye on the project. Um, 
It's not a production strength compiler. There's lots and lots of bugs. Lots of things that will actually cause um, simply compiler panics when you, you feed it something that's not really, really nice to it. Um, Ben's working through formalizing the type system in COC. Um, once that, he's going to get back on working on the compiler and then hopefully driven by the, the proofs, um, fix a lot of those bugs and then we can make a real thing go at making this a working compiler. And who would you be targeting? It, like some, who would choose it as a production <coughs> thing and why? Okay, so the question is who's you, who would choose DDC and Disciple as a production compiler? When it works. When it works. Yeah. <laughs> okay, when it works. Um, ben has actually suggested that, that a really good target audience might actually be the current OCaml people. Um, the OCaml compiler and the infrastructure around it is somewhat moribund. There's not a lot of new development. They, they, they churn out new compiler versions here and there, but it, it's a language that's very close to Disciple in that it's, it's a language that's mostly functional um, with mutability, because um, OCaml has reference types. Um, it also allows, OCaml allows you to drop a printf wherever you like, because it doesn't care about side effects. DDC sort of does better than not care about them, it actually tracks them. Um, so that's that's a target audience, and do we support Unicode? Do we support Unicode? Uh, no, not yet. Um, I think DDC and Disciple have made a better choice about the string type than Haskell did back in the early 90s. So um, not, not very hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so there's no reason we can't. Um, do Unicode at some stage, but um, there's a lot of stuff that's got to be done before then. Is it lazy by default? Um, it's not. So the question is, is it lazy by default? No, it's actually strict by default with optional lazy. Um, that's probably the biggest departure from Haskell. Well, I'll say thank you very much. <laughs>